Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Hey everybody, Tom Woods here. Delighted to welcome Wanjiru Njoya back to the show. This is episode 2476. She holds a PhD from Cambridge University. She is the author of Redressing Historical Injustice, Self-Ownership, Property Rights, and Economic Equality. She is the bane of the existence of the entire DEI establishment, uh, always has interesting and provocative things to say. If you're not following her on Twitter, I don't know what to tell you. You are missing out on a, on a real t- uh, treat. I almost said a real tweet, but <laughs> you really are missing out on a real treat. It's, it's almost like not following Michael Malice on Twitter. Like, why would you do that to yourself? Well, same with her. I'll put her, uh, Wanjira's uh, Twitter handle in the, uh, in the description of the video and also on the show notes page, tomwoods.com slash 2476. Wanjira, welcome back. Thanks, Tom. It's great to be back. There's so many things to talk about. Like, like just in prepping for this, I went back and actually, uh, your tweets generally pop up in my feed. But all the same, I went back to scroll through what you've written because it's always interesting and provocative. And man, I jotted down a whole bunch of things we can <laughs> talk about. But there's one that you mentioned to me via email that I thought would be a, a good place to start because there's now, there's more and more talk these days about hate crime laws and restrictions on speech uh, and speech constituting a kind of a hate crime that you could be prosecuted for. And there was the whole matter of uh, J.K. Rowling uh, tweeting out things about uh, tra- the transgender issue and all that. So we'll, we'll get to that. But you in particular were, were talking about uh, feminists who are unhappy with this whole hate crime and hate speech apparatus because all of a sudden it's targeting them. What's the story? So basically, they are, in fact, there are two groups of feminists fighting each other. And I think this is the thing to understand. So one group of feminists say, you're a woman because your sex determines that you're a woman. And the other group of feminists say, no, you're a woman because being a woman is great. And as long as you say you're a woman, then you're a woman. So the two of them have been fighting for a long time. They have protection as a protected group because they're women. They're very happy about that. And they're always fighting against men. So they're very happy about that. Now the problem is if you call somebody a woman when he thinks, you know, if you call a man a woman because he thinks he's a woman, but you, I mean, if you call a man a man when he thinks he's a woman, that's a hate crime. Yeah. So see, this is, this is what they're really upset about. And now I think everyone saw this on the news. In Scotland, they're saying if you misgender anybody, that's a hate crime and you can go to jail for up to seven years. So that's what's hit the news. So they're saying the problem with jailing people for seven years for hate crime is that now I can't fight with the other feminists because if I fight with them, they can have me locked up for a hate crime. Yeah. So that's what I was saying. It's kind of reducing the whole hate crime debate to an intersectional war between two groups of feminists, which is ridiculous. Isn't it interesting, though, that the kind of warning we might have made to people in the past, or we might have said something like, uh, be careful what you wish for. Yes. You know, if you get these types of laws, um, they could come back to hurt you. And maybe yeah. that didn't sound very plausible because people on the left thought, well, we run all the institutions. That's never going to happen to me. And then all of a sudden, it actually is happening to them far more suddenly than they than they thought. And not because right-wingers got in charge and decided to stick it to the left. It was just that being on the left means y- y- you have to always be, um, you have to always be evolving or otherwise you've suddenly drifted into right-wingism because suddenly you're not at the forefront of whatever the latest crazy left-wing demand is. You're automatically a counter-revolutionary. So the hate hate crime laws and hate speech laws are coming for you. It's exactly that, Tom. Now the feminists who were the safest people you would have thought are at risk of being jailed by the other feminists who are the more kind of right-on feminists, the ones who say being a woman is anything. So so that's what it is. But what, what I find even more astonishing is that people are joining battle to defend the feminists who are fighting not to be jailed but the same feminists who are fighting not to be jailed for calling men, women men or men women 
are also trying to get men jailed for misogyny. So yeah. they haven't learned the lesson. People say, oh, you know, when it, when it comes back to bite them in the behind, they'll learn. They don't learn. Yeah, yeah, no kid. So, so now that we're in this situation, uh, suddenly it's okay to argue about uh, hate speech laws because yeah. now the respectable people are, are saying that may, there might be a problem with them. We've been trying to warn about this for some time. And we've said, um, I mean, we have many arguments, but one of them is, who knows whether the, the, the idea of what constitutes, quote, hate is in the eye of the beholder. It could mean something today and something else tomorrow. It could target you tomorrow. Um, this is why it's best just to not go down this road and just say, grow up. Some yeah. people are going to say mean things and you deal with it. Like, that's what, that's how everybody else de deals with it. You know, I was just thinking just today about, because uh, I just wrote about it in my email newsletter. There was a case uh, a couple of months ago at Princeton University where Professor Robert George was invited by a student to have lunch at one of their, what they call, eating clubs. And then shortly after that lunch, a new policy was announced that you can't bring anybody but friends and family to lunch, to, to this building during food uh, preparation and, and serving hours. And well, that seemed like a strange thing. Well, Robert George is against same-sex marriage. So it turns out that what happened was a group complained to the club that they should be notified when such a person is coming so that they don't they have the right not to be in his presence and they can adjust accordingly. And so the, the club acceded to this crazy demand. And that, the reason I bring up that example is that those people like that have to deal with one person they disagree with quietly coming into a building and having lunch. I, on the other hand, even in the relatively tamer climate of the early 1990s, was surrounded by people who had dramatically different worldviews from me that I found to be appalling and evil. I was surrounded by them 24 hours a day. Almost all the speakers brought to campus were the same way. Th th these ideas were affirmed everywhere I turned. These people can't handle half an hour in the presence of somebody quietly eating his lunch who himself would never demand that those people not come in and eat lunch on, on their own terms. And so when you realize how utterly intolerant these people are, if they were ever in my shoes, they would, they would collapse in 15 seconds. They couldn't survive it. But it's so revealing when you see the way they act that one little thing, even being in the presence of somebody who had an uninclusive thought at some time means he can't be included in this building. I don't know how you keep it all straight other than their, their approach to life is whatever advances the revolution is allowed and whatever doesn't uh, is to be punished. I mean, what, what else are we to conclude from this? Yes, and they, they know that that's the path to power. That's why they do it. They, they do it because that's how you gain power. They, they, they claim to feel unsafe. You know, I'm not safe if this person is in there eating lunch because, you know, I feel uh, feel so unsafe. I feel so erased. It's a path to power. That's why they do it. In fact, the more vulnerable you express yourself to be, the more power you have to exclude others. So the reason why you had to tolerate all those people around you is because you didn't claim to be vulnerable. You didn't claim to feel unsafe. Unfortunately, we've just created a society where the more people complain about vulnerability, the more, <clears throat> excuse me, the more powerful they are. So that's why they do it. We've created the incentives for people to do that. And it's similar, it's linked to a hate crime that we were discussing earlier, because the whole point of hate crime is people feeling particularly vulnerable. So um, I was just giving the example, if you steal something from a white person, they would report that as a crime. But if you steal something from a black person, they can report that as a hate crime. So it's um, the self-expressed vulnerability that gives people a more powerful position. Because if I can report my crime as worse than the crime that happened to you, that puts me in a powerful position. It means that the, uh, well, it means two things. It means that uh, whoever attacks me gets a heavier penalty than the person who attacks you. But it also means that people who commit crimes get a more lenient uh, penalty from the legal system because of that vulnerability. I mean, sentencing guidelines, now they're saying sentencing guidelines 
should take that vulnerability into account. So that puts people in a more powerful position. So in a way, I always think we we can't really blame people for uh, choosing the path to power that we created. Well, now you've lived in the UK for quite some time. And I, I've just been reading articles um, by, let's say, right of center people be, uh, being critical of the courts and the Supreme Court over there. For, for those of us in the U.S. who know nothing about the condition of the court system there, um, can you, because of course in the U.S., the, the, the courts can be used to, um, you know, to, in, in, in completely defensible ways, but they can also be used to push forward social revolution if they so choose. For those of us in the U.S. who aren't following what's going on over there, can you describe the, the state of things? So if I can summarize it, just imagine uh, a Supreme Court of the United States. First of all, the Supreme Court in the UK is relatively new. That was established uh, by Tony Blair. But just imagine, to give an analogy, imagine a situation where you had a Supreme Court uh, in the United States and the judges are all appointed, all of them, by somebody from the Department of Justice. Imagine a situation like that. So th there's not really an equivalent here because different presidents get to appoint somebody to, to the Supreme Court. So you have a chance of having a reasonably balanced court or at least not having the court entirely uh, leaning one way. But that safeguard isn't there in the UK because judges are appointed by the Judicial Appointments Commission. So they're all left-leaning. They're basically, basically a group of socialists making decisions and now starting to... So, so for a long time, people said, well, it doesn't really matter because in the UK constitution, parliament is uh, sovereign, parliament is supreme, and uh, the courts do not have power to override parliament. So people said, well, what does it matter? The court's not that powerful anyway. But of course, what's happening in recent years, and this is the problem... The court is used up in more and more power to itself. We saw that during Brexit, when Parliament said, right, we're going to exit, and the Supreme Court says, no, you, you can't do that unless you follow the following steps, which you haven't followed. So in a way, they were able to, to strike down Parliament's attempt uh, to exit from the European Union. So that's why people are becoming alarmed. And it, it was just in the news uh, a couple of days ago because... They said they're going to become a world-leading court. So they're just growing too big for their shoes. That's, so that's, what, the, uh, that's what the debate there is about. It, it's, there's so much out there that's so demoralizing. And yet, and yet, whenever any of these public officials post, you know, one of their, you know, one of their piles of platitudes, like, for example, just the other day, I think it was, uh, Secretary of State Blinken posted something about how, you know, in this month of women, it's Women's Month or Women's History Month or whatever month it is. Uh, it's always something, isn't it? But in this month, I and in this particular day, I'm thinking about the women who have served as Secretary of State of the United States and how they've advanced U.S. foreign policy. Then you look in the comments, and there's almost nobody saying, you're right, Secretary Blinken, we're really proud of these female Secretaries of State. The whole comment section is, oh, what a relief that now women are in a position to incinerate foreigners for no good reason and carry out our, our holy and, and, and uh, unquestionable uh, bipartisan foreign policy. I mean, it's all cynicism. The entire comment section uh, is entirely pushing back. There is no Anthony Blinken cheerleading section. It's all people who are fully awake and fully understand what's going on. So it's it's such an odd situation that there are so many people who don't in any way buy these platitudes, and yet the rest of society acts like this is normal, like Anthony Blinken is somebody to listen to, um, like like the platitudes are meaningful, or Hillary Clinton is somehow admirable. Uh, it's it's weird, and I, I wish it would somehow resolve itself at some point. Yeah, I don't know. I think that. Uh... People are unhappy and they complain and there's the cynicism, as you point out, but nobody is prepared to take a stand on anything. And I'm not really sure why that is. So, so for example, um, 
you know, people will complain about hate crimes or, you know, anything that's introduced. They will, but if anybody stands up and says, let's get rid of hate crimes, let's abolish it, they all suddenly go quiet. Nobody wants to stand for what they're actually saying is the correct thing to do. And what I think is the reason for that, as far as I can see, is that people feel like taking a stand in some odd way is going too far. Complaining is fine because all we're doing is complaining. But if somebody says, well, actually stand up against this, it feels like it's going too far. And people always want to seem measured and balanced and not extremist. <laughs> and I think it does just the sense that um, if you're actually proposing to do anything, that that's an extremist position. Hey, everybody, you know that in our day and age, we are faced with information overload, and a lot of that information is a complete waste of your time. Well, I have an excellent way to deal with it. With Blinkist, you can absorb huge amounts of information in 27 nonfiction categories. So history, philosophy, parenting, career, technology, religion, and on and on. And Blinkist condenses each book into 15-minute summaries you can read or listen to. So if you have a half-hour commute each way, you can absorb the equivalent of four books. You think that might make you a more impressive person? And among the thousands and thousands of titles at Blinkist, you'll find libertarian classics as well, by Rothbard, by Friedman, dare I say, even Woods, your very own host here. Well, right now, Blinkist has a special offer just for our audience. Go to Blinkist.com Woods to start your seven-day free trial and get 40% off a Blinkist premium membership. That's Blinkist, spelled B-L-I-N-K-I-S-T, Blinkist.com slash Woods to get 40% off and a seven-day free trial. Blinkist.com slash Woods. And now for a limited time, you can even use Blinkist Connect to share your premium account. You'll get two premium subscriptions for the price of one. Yeah, and so that's, that's why things have proceeded to this point, is that one side has is is operating with absolute determination yeah and you know and and the other side you know maybe has its misgivings but they just can't bring themselves to do anything no because doing things uh they seem see, see here's the thing about the left if they do something quite shocking or say things that are shocking they they that doesn't seem to perturb them but I think what happens on the right is that people are wary of saying things that seem shocking. We're always trying to say something that's going to sound very softly, softly. And that's, yeah. that's a problem. Yeah. It's like a self-limiting habit. I do think, at least in the U.S., that it's become possible to speak more frankly over the past five or six years. But even so, if I were in a corporate environment and I had a woke HR department um, you know, breathing down my neck and, 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 you know, a woke board, um, I would still feel a, a temptation to censor myself because it's true that in, I don't work for anybody. I can get away with doing whatever I want. Uh, so it's easy for me to say things have gotten better, but in the corporate world, they, they, they certainly have it. Maybe in politics, they've gotten a little bit better. But man, I mean, they the, the the other side has a real stranglehold on the public square at this point. So I, I I mean, I in a way, I don't want to excuse it, but I at least understand why people hesitate to do anything because they feel like my life's going to be ruined. I get only one life. I'd like to enjoy it. So I regret very much what's happening, but I'm only one person. And what can I do? You really expect me to be a martyr and sacrifice everything I've worked for so that I can defend some principles in public? I, I, just doesn't seem like a, a winning formula. I'm sure that's the way people think. That, that explains uh, a lot of them who are at risk of losing their positions. And uh, I think we all, you know, nobody can tell anybody else what sacrifices to make. But it doesn't explain the people. So let me give an example of the DEI the whole DEI thing. So many people think that DEI should be abolished. That's no longer a shocking thing to say. Many states are taking action against it. I was just looking at this in the New York Times this morning, actually. So about 20 states are against DEI. And so that's becoming a kind of mainstream 
uh, position to take, to be against DEI. It's not like a shocking thing to say, yeah, right? Shouldn't incur any risk to say that. But yet when you look at the, uh, the people, uh, so in Texas and Florida, when they ab- abolish DEI, just scroll down to the bottom of their announcements and they're saying things like, now that we got rid of DEI, let's do equal opportunities better. Let's do equal. They came right back to, <laughs> to me. It's like coming right back to where we started. Like, no, no, don't do that. Get rid of it and move on with confidence. But instead they say, well, you know, we'll have, I was just looking at the Texas announcement this morning. They say, we closed down all the DEI offices. We're reassigning the DEI people because they're so good. And, you know, they, they're doing such good work. So we're just going to reassign them to other offices where they can continue supporting our students. Excuse me. Well, that's, that's the problem we're trying to fix. <laughs> oh, oh, no. Well, they you don't have to, they don't have to cave, but they do. You've criticized people who have said things like, DEI may be well-intentioned, but it has all these terrible consequences. And you stop them right there at the very beginning and say, it is not well-intentioned. No. Now, we used to say in the old days, oh, these are well-intentioned government policies that have un- unanticipated consequences and whatever, and are you know, unintended consequences. You know, and, and by the way, some I'm sure some policies are invented by dumb people who can't think three steps ahead and they do have unintended consequences. But for the most part, when a policy yields a particular outcome again and again and again, whatever it is, anti-poverty programs give you more poverty, whatever it is, when they yield the same results over and over and over again, I think at that point you have to assume that the intention of the policy is what it does. You have to assume that. It is, of course, it's not unintentional or anything like that, because let's remember these people, there's a, there's a small cohort. Okay, a lot of them are just along for the ride or they're stupid or whatever, but there's a small cohort of committed people. They're socialists, so this is what they want to achieve. They're not achieving it by accident. They did not accidentally transform equal opportunities into equal outcomes because they weren't paying attention. That's exactly what they want to achieve. They're being treated as if they were kind of, it somehow went wrong along the way, but that's their actual goal. And they said that's their goal. But what do you say then to people um, who at least rhetorically will say, look, all we're trying to do is overturn uh, historical injustices and level the playing field. You know, a lot of people have been treated badly in the past, so we can't give them equal opportunity. Um, so we're going to have to give them a boost through DEI and, uh, you know, whoever is displaced, will find something somewhere, but for heaven's sake, we got to integrate everybody into the society and it's, it's not happening organically. So it's going to have to happen through state intervention. These are the most dangerous people. They are more dangerous than Marxists. See, a Marxist comes at you from the front and says, I'm a Marxist and I want to abolish I don't know, private ownership of the means of production. So you know you can see your enemy and you can have some kind of uh, debate with that person. They can try to persuade people to Marxism and you can try to show why Marxism doesn't work. And that's a, it's in a way, it's a fair battle. But the people you describe, these are the worst kind of enemy because they purport to agree with you. There, there was, oh yes, you know, Marxism is wrong. Equal outcomes is wrong. I'm not into that. All I want to do is equal opportunities. You know, we just want to achieve justice. These are the most dangerous people. These are actually the people that Tom Sowell was talking about in his chapter on uh, the quiet repeal of the American Revolution. He says the people repealing the American Revolution are not the self-identified communists who say I'm a communist and I want revolt. Those are not the dangerous people. He says the dangerous people are the ones who say all we're doing is equality and all we're doing is, uh, as you say, giving people opportunities. Meanwhile, they're dismantling the American Constitution. So that's that's what I would say. These these people are not harmless. They look harmless, and that's why they're more dangerous. Why do you think? I'm, and by the way, I'm assuming this is how you think that the the ballyhooed distinction that 
establishment conservatives like to make between equality of opportunity versus equality of result is really a false dichotomy. Well, this, this, this is precisely the problem that I'm trying to describe because are you asking why it's a false dichotomy or are you asking why they draw this false dichotomy? Well, I, I, yeah, because I used to think, oh, I don't want equality of outcome. I just want equality of opportunity. And then I read, I think I read something by George Reisman that said, that, but this whole phrase, equality of opportunity, is, gives them a, 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 a gap they can drive a truck through. Oh, well, so in order to give equality of opportunity, we have to give the following things. You know, so you're still opening up the door. You're not stopping them by changing the wording and saying, oh, this is a whole different concept. They'll make that into whatever concept they want. In order to provide equality of opportunity, then, real equality of opportunity means transfer programs, affirmative action, yeah. whatever. But for the conservatives, presumably, so so if you talk about the, the, the socialists who are trying to do that, that is true. They they introduced, the people who introduced equality of opportunity, they knew the whole time that they're going to use it to achieve equality of outcomes. So in a way, they are easy to understand. That's their goal and that's what you expect them to do. But I think it's the, the, it's the conservatives that you are trying to... Um, to shine the spotlight on because these are not people who want to introduce equality of outcome and yet they support equality of opportunity. Why would they do that? I think it's partly because, uh, I, well, there's two things. Partly you have people who think all these schemes will produce equality of opportunity as long as we do it very well. So you find, for example, Republicans saying DEI is terrible, we need to get rid of it and introduce proper DEI. You know, we want to do DEI, but we want to do DEI the right way. So you get those people who think it anything can work as long as you do it properly. But then I think you also get the type of people we were describing earlier who think, I don't want to look like a, uh, I don't want to look like a fascist. And if I say I'm against equality of opportunity, <laughs> that's what's going to look, that's how it's going to look. And so they're uh, agreeing with it for that reason, because it allows them to say, I'm not so extreme as to be against equality of opportunity. I only go as far as being against equality of outcome. Hey, everybody, it's All Woods here with a mini, mini interview with our friend Jeff Deist, whose appearances on the Tom Woods show you all love so much. And we're talking about monetary metals, where he works now. And you've heard me talk about this nonstop. So now it's going to be Jeff's turn to talk about it. Jeff, tell me about monetary metals. What is the value here? Well, Tom, remember back in the day when Ron Paul used to ask Ben Bernanke, then chairman of the Federal Reserve, what's gold? What's the purpose of gold? Is it money? Why does the Fed hold it? And of course, he waffled and said it's a historical relic and it's just a precious metal, but it's not. I mean, for more than 5,000 years, Gold's been money. There's $13 trillion worth of it out there just sitting around in bank vaults. Why don't we generate some interest from that? Why don't we put it to work as money, as a capital asset? That's the idea behind monetary metals. So what, what does a person have to do to be part? Do you have to come in there owning your own gold? Do they sell you the gold? How does it work? Absolutely not. Whether you've got physical metals that you want to ship to us safely or whether you want to simply send a bank wire or a check, we can convert your money into gold and get you started earning interest right away. All right, everybody, check it out. Monetary-metals.com slash Woods. I have an account there. I know the people who work there. We all know Jeff Deist. So check it out for yourself. Monetary-metals.com slash Woods. So now, um, with there's in just, I don't know how recent this is, but I think pretty recent. There's been this matter of a private uh, club, a male club. Like, is it the Garrick Club over, yes. over there? Where uh, the, uh, feminists want women to be able to be admitted and it's been yeah. men only for like 200 years. Uh, I want to talk about that also because that's also, re that's in some ways related to this same kind of conversation. Yes. See, they've been, they've been trying for some years now to barge into the private members' men's clubs, of which there are a few. And they say, well, you know, what are those, what are those men talking about in their private members' clubs? They are, you know, they're, they're, they're helping each other to get business opportunities. They're 
giving each other tips on how to, you know, how to get forward in their career. And there, if women are not allowed to be in there, we're excluded and that's unfair. By the way, women are allowed as long as they're guests of a member. They're just not allowed to be members. Mm. So, they're, so they're saying we want to be members because that way. So they've been trying for some time to get into these clubs. But what I find uh, so ironic is that the same women are currently fighting for men not to invade women's spaces. You know, they're calling them sex, uh, single sex spaces for women. They say, well, women need our single sex spaces. We don't want men invading. And now that men are allowed to save their women under British law, and now they're joining women's spaces and they're saying this is not right because we're entitled to have spaces that are just for women. And in the very same breath, they want to invade spaces that are just for men. That's that's the paradox. They, they don't see that the very same weapon they use to invade the men's clubs is the same method that the trans women use to invade their clubs. But there's more. Now it's extended beyond just a battle between men and women because we have all these other identity groups. Okay, so now you have to have women in the clubs. Well, what about all these other lobbies waiting for their equal opportunities, all wanting to get into the clubs? It's a great shame. And the, the, the simple solution for a normal person is start your own club. I mean, really, these are the same people. These are exactly the same people who, if you complained about Facebook's policies, they would say, start your own social media outlet, which is really difficult to do, by the way, but that would be their answer. Or start your own video platform, which is overwhelmingly difficult to do, even though Rumble seems to have accomplished it. Well, far, far easier than that is start your own club. You know, you could do that tomorrow. You could rent some space and, you know, you're, you're off to the races and in business. And yet, even that's too much to ask of these people. Well, they actually have women only private members clubs. They do. I, I remember, it's not that they don't have clubs for women only. They, they, want, they think, well, it's okay to have clubs for women only because women are a protected group, but it's not okay to have clubs for men only. They want to invade that and know they don't see any problem with this. So it's one of the points I was trying to make is that this idea of freedom of association is getting completely lost. The idea that people are free to choose with home to associate, you hardly ever hear people talking about that these days. And that's a, that's a great loss. Then instead of asking, instead of uh, defending people's right to associate with whom they want, everything is being evaluated according to the identity. So if the identity group is women, they can meet by themselves if they want to. But if the identity group is men, then they can't meet by themselves if they want to. They have to include women and all other kinds of groups will be following along. If by some miracle, women were somehow to start outperforming men in terms of income and social influence and whatever, would they be willing to commit right now that at that moment, they will then yield all their single sex spaces and that men can apply for membership? Or was that really probably just one way? It's one way because, in fact, women have been outperforming men in schools. Well, I should say girls have been outperforming boys in schools for decades now. It's been reported decade after decade that boys are underperforming in schools, you know, because teachers now are mostly women. The styles of education are suited to teaching girls. The curriculum is suited to what girls want to learn. And they've been outperforming boys and nobody is alarmed. So in the UK, they've produced report after report on this, and nobody cares. It's, it's the double standards uh, that are inherent in this whole discourse. There will never come a time when they'll say, and perhaps this links to what we were saying about equal opportunities earlier, there will never come a time when they will say, right, we redressed the imbalance, we redressed the injustice, thank you, we now have opportunities. This day will never come. It just, it just seems odd that literally 500 years from now, people will still be saying the same things. At that point, I wonder, will, be, will there be any commentator who will say, look, it's been 500 years. I mean, at some point, <laughs> you have to just say, um, we've done everything we can. Now, now you got to just, you know, just try your best and let the chips fall where they may. I mean, it's been 500 years. 
I mean, yes. what if it's a thousand? A thousand no. years? <laughs> you can't say that's just, we've tried everything. No, You're no, on no, your they, own. It will never happen, Tom, for the simple reason that uh, I can give you two examples of this. Look at the example of what's happening in South Africa. They said, we want, a, uh, we want democracy, so now everybody can vote. The black majority is over 80%. They said, right now we want equity, which means we want special favors to promote us over the tiny minority of white people. So people said, well, fair enough. You know, you've been oppressed for so long, so fair enough, you, you can do this. They excluded white people from jobs, excluded them from uh, education, excluded them from universities. And now you have uh, the white population saying we're excluded from everything. We have no options. All we can do is support each other to be, you know, to be self-employed, to run farms and to just try and help each other out. Guess what's happened now? The black majority saying, hey, we, we, we're being excluded from the white farms. We're being excluded. They're just chasing up after them. So the reason why, the reason why uh, time never resolves this problem is that no matter where people run, the entitled people will always be following behind. And this will go on time without end. There'll never be a time that will come where this will stop happening. And, and the other example that, um, that I could give relates to the Garrick. There was a, an article in the Telegraph about that saying, well, those men from the Garrick, if the women invade, if they don't want to talk with women, they will just go and meet somewhere else. They don't have to meet in the Garrick, right? They could go and meet in somebody's house or anywhere. So what's going to happen then? The next thing we're going to see is women saying, oh, look, these men are meeting in somebody's house. We're not included. I wasn't invited. That's unfair. They'll be chasing up after them into their private homes. So, so this is why it becomes an endless cycle and why there's no limit to it. Because wherever it's driven by envy and wherever people are that others are envious of, they will follow. Right. I, I, I don't remember if it was you or somebody I was reading was saying that if you proceed in this way and you say, we're going to barge in to this club and demand membership, then the people who really do want to have that kind of a club will just create a super duper elite club that will be more secret that yes. you won't find, but they're going to continue doing it. Yeah, exactly. But but here's the thing: when they when they do find it, they will then say they want to be included in that. So so another thing that is alarming to me is the erosion of that distinction between public and private. So remember, the Garrick is a private club; it's not public. There's no reason. It's it's exactly as if they met in somebody's home. So if you can invade a club just because they meet in the city of London, what's the difference between that and invading somebody's home where they're meeting with friends to talk? And just to give an example to show that this is not so far-fetched, is Scotland's new uh, hate crime law that applies in people's private homes. If you're talking at your family dinner table, and you say something that's hate speech, and your child happens to mention it to the teacher the next morning, like something that was said at dinner that was hate speech, they, the teacher can report that to the police. And you can get arrested and charged and imprisoned for something you said in the privacy of your own home. So they have eroded that distinction between public and private. And at that point, in order to enforce this, could you imagine the enforcement of this? And what this is going to look like. And, and then a, a, again, as you say, if, if it is a matter of, um, I mean, we've already seen the Scotland law, but if it, it becomes a matter of we're really, really aggressively going to prevent uh, men from meeting together and they genuinely do retreat into a private home and then they're actually going to invade that, maybe you at some point reach a level where the average person says, now that's just a step too far. But I don't know, the average person seems awfully tolerant. The average person, so when, when Scotland's, people don't find it alarming. When Scotland's law was proposed, when they said it'll apply in people's private homes and people said, what's the harm? Because the law, the statute that applies is actually called the Public Order Act. So people said, well, what public order is being put at risk by what I'm saying inside my house? 
And the justice minister at the time, who's now the first minister of Scotland, he said, well, you may be in your house, but somebody may be passing by. They might overhear you. Or your child may go to school and report what you said, and that way it becomes a public matter, even though you said it within your home. So, so no, people, people don't seem to get alarmed. If anything, and this was one thing that I commented on as well, people seem to just think it's all a big joke. They just laugh about it and say, oh, how ridiculous is this? It isn't really a joke. It's a threat to liberty. Well, I hate to say, well, thanks for joining us today, Wanjiro. I mean, it just doesn't seem like I can end like this. Um, you know, I, I, it's like I, every episode I'm reduced to, well, as long as more people figure out what's going on. Maybe. I don't know. It seems like it should be obvious enough to people what's going on. Uh, and not to mention the everybody I'm supposed to be appealing to and hoping will see the light are having their ideas formed in indoctrination centers for 13 years. So I, I don't know, it seems like a, it seems, you know, hard to hope for. Well, as you said, Tom, I think in one of your earlier pieces that you wrote, I saw this on lourockwell.com where you said, we don't need to win over the majority of people. We don't need to persuade the whole country that this is a problem. You need a core of people who understand that it's a problem and who are thinking about ways to resolve it. Because even if you look at what the socialists are doing, you wouldn't say the majority of people support all these crazy ideas. The majority of people don't. So that they, just as they don't need to persuade a majority, neither do we need to persuade a majority. We need just a core of committed people who see the need to take action. That's all it takes. So there's, you know, there's a hopeful note to sound. Yes, and I, I appreciate that very much. So... I am again going to. Is, is your is your um, Twitter handle? Is it is it the reverse of your first and last name? I can't remember. No, it's just uh, Wanjiro Joya. It is. Wanjiro Joya is my name. Yeah. Okay. W a n j i r u and then n j o y a. But I'll have that in the description of the video. Also, tomwoods.com slash twenty four seventy six. So you got to follow Wanjiro. Come on now, people. You got to follow her. She's got very important things to say, and she has a really entertaining and, and, and fun and sometimes confrontational way of saying them. So, so you're going to love following her. Thanks so much uh, for joining me once again. Thanks so much, Tom, for having me on. And thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit TomWoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time. Like the sound of The Tom Woods Show? My audio production is provided by Podsworth Media. Check them out at podsworth.com.